Uh, if you are our guest, my name is Will Rambo. I'm one of the pastors here at the Orchard Tublo. Glad you're here for Formation Night. So uh, somebody asked, said, I got to visit with a friend before, and they said this was their first time in our Wednesday night gathering, and I said, me too. Uh, we've only had two, and I was sick for the last one. Our friend Wes Riggle did an incredible job teaching. Uh, this is something new we're trying this fall. We don't know how it'll go. We don't know how long we'll do it, but we're trying them once a month for the fall. Wes set us up by talking about this idea of uh, what it looks like for us to be mature, to grow, to be more like Jesus. And that, that's what we're going to continue talking about tonight. Uh, there's a, a verse in 2 Corinthians 3, verse 18. Paul is writing to the church at Corinth. And over the last year and a half, this is a verse that's shown up in a couple of sermons around here um, because it's really been something that's shaping the way I look at what it means for us to follow Jesus. And I think that's why Paul put it, so we would all see it and, and reflect. He says, some of us who've had the veil removed can see and reflect the glory of the Lord. And the Lord, who is the Spirit, makes us more and more like Him as we are changed into His glorious image. Paul says... The, the idea is that as the Spirit lives in us, we are formed more and more into the image of Jesus. And, and the, the phrasing for that is this idea of spiritual formation. And if that's a new term for you, it's one that we've been using uh, some around here, and you're, we're going to use increasingly more. This is my favorite, simplest definition. Uh, Robert Mulholland was a longtime professor at Asbury Seminary where I went to school, and he says spiritual formation is the process of being formed in the image of Jesus for the sake of others. And I love that second part. It's not just that we sit in our, our little holy huddles by ourselves and read and memorize more. It is that we are shaped into the image of Jesus for the sake of others, that we are to be relational and connected to others. Um, and so that's some of what we want to talk about together tonight. We want to start building a grid and a map for what that actually looks like. I think if you were to ask anybody who's a follower of Jesus, would you like to grow and be more like Jesus? They would go, sure. But, but where do you begin? How does it start? So we want to give you a roadmap. This is a roadmap that we've been talking about a lot around here, is that spiritual formation is centered around the practices, which is what we're going to talk about tonight. And as we learn those practices, we participate in mission with Jesus. There are places and moments in our life where God moves in a mighty way. There are people who shape and form us by their, their uh, mentoring us or us walking alongside or us investing in them, which leads us to begin to live by certain postures that we don't just learn things from the Bible, but we actually begin to apply them to our life. If practices are where we learn what it's like to be in the ways of Jesus, postures are where we exercise it and live it out. So tonight, all we're, Wes has given me a limited time, so we're only going to talk about one of these five pieces. We're going to talk about practices tonight. What are the habits? What is forming us? What forms you? What impacts the way that you think? Um, do, do you have a certain news channel that you watch? Some would argue that that has a formational impact on us. Do you have certain things that you follow on social media or on Twitter? Do you shop on certain websites? What's forming you? Uh, we're constantly being formed. I read a great book a couple of years ago called You Are What You Love by James Smith, which the subtitle is perfect for tonight, The Spiritual Power of Habit. And, and in Smith's book, what he says is, his whole thesis is, we are what we worship. We are what we worship, what we attune our attention to, that our, our longings, our desires, our affections, they shape the trajectory of the rest of our lives. And so he keeps asking the question over and over, what is it you love? It's not a question of if we worship. It's a question of what we worship. We have to recognize that those habits, those things we love, are often learned. Uh, we were in the, uh, tr my truck uh, last week, and a song came on the radio by uh, a musician that some of you will know and some of you may not, named James Taylor. And I just started singing the lyrics of it. And uh, one of my children looked at me and they said, why do you know this old song? <laughs> and I said, well, because cause you're, you're pop, my dad. I said, because pop is old. And so that was my joke with them. I was like, I know this song because this is one of three cassette tapes 
that my dad had in his single cab Nissan pickup truck in 1992. And every day on the way to school, we had one of three options. We listened to James Taylor, we listened to the Doobie Brothers, or we listened to Mark Cohn when Walking in Memphis came out. And those were, I was like, so I know every word to every one of those albums or cassettes because that's what I learned them because Pop loved them. And I'm going to give you a visual image, and I'm going to let you know the practical example of what I'm about to cook, put up is going to be emotionally difficult for some of you, okay? But just bear with me. It has a point. So I'm just preparing. You have been warned. Adult advisory, okay? Let's look at this image. I, I'm not making any fan for the plug. I'm, I, I saw one friend earlier, and I said hello from afar, and I'm like, he's going to be real happy in like 18 minutes. Um, here, here's why I bring this up. Based on, if you are from Mississippi, you probably have some emotional reaction more than if you're not from the state of Mississippi. If you were raised as a fan of the University of Mississippi, you probably have a different reaction to this image than if you were raised as a fan of Mississippi State University. All right. That's my only point. I, I'm not making any argument for one or the other. I, I'm, and, and please go with me on the illustration and don't think there's a state Ole Miss joke coming because there's not. This image matters to me, and I have an affection for this image, this instrument, if you will, not because I think it's the greatest university on the planet. We, are, we all know that universities are universities. We have a bias based on our affection. This matters to me because when I hear the sound of it, I what I really think of is growing up eating popcorn with my grandparents at a ball game. That, that's what this image forms in me. It's not just about the fact that they got a lot of my money for four years when I was in school there. It, it's, it's about the fact that there are so many memories. It's why I'm never bothered when somebody goes, well, I'm a fan of this institution. I want, well, tell me about it. Well, of course you are. Because it's a part of what forms us, these habits of being part of the rhythms and practices. If you are a fan of the University of Mississippi, the hallowed ground known as the Grove is more than grass and trees for you, not because it's more than grass and trees, but because of the conversations and the stories and the meals and the moments that you've had there. That makes sense to me because the things that are habits in our life, they have a formative impact and they curve and shape our affection. So let's take an earlier example I used. This is why I think living in an echo chamber of only one set of information is not always helpful for us. Because what we hear, what we receive, shapes and forms the way we view everything else. Now, for those of you that have been hurting and bothered by this image, I'll take it off the screen now. We're done with it. I won't bring it back up, I promise. But, but let me stop for a minute. Does any of that make sense to you? Simply the idea that we view things based, based on how... I had a friend in college who was uh, from uh, a northernmost state. Engineering student, that's how they ended up at Mississippi State. My grandmother had a rule. I was in school in Starkville. She lived in West Point. Any kid who didn't have a place to eat Thanksgiving was coming to our house. And so I drug this Minnesota native to my grandmother's. And I, I remember the moment of standing in line. He's getting food. He's like, this is all. And he pauses. And he points and he goes, what in God's name is that? And I go, that's green bean casserole. And he goes, it looks like you took green beans and melted worms around them. Like, that's what it looks like. And I'm like, buddy, you say one more word like that, you'll eat outside. But we're shaped, we're formed by what we know. Love and hate are both learned practices. We're taught it. It's learned. We become what we love. Uh, if you have a psychology background, William James is a well-known psychologist and philosopher in the 1800s, and he did some of the earliest work on habits, which is something I've really been looking at over the last year when I think about my own life. And he, what he looked at with habits is that they are, they're, our lives are all constantly comprised of what he called bundles of habits. That if you go, well, I'm not a routine person, I'm not an organized person. I had several conversations uh, two weeks ago here at the Orchard Tupelo. We talked about uh, a rule of life. A couple of you showed me that you brought them with you tonight. And I've had several cups of coffees or emails with folks who go, I'm just not a routine person. But the thing is, we all are routine people. We're just not living into our routines on purpose. We're accidentally living in the rhythms that, we chose, that we've chosen. 
that's what James argues, is that we have certain ways we go about things, times we get up in the morning, times we go to bed at night. And he goes on to say that habits are automatic behavioral responses to environmental cues or triggers. They are automated responses to environmental cues or triggers. They're the things you do without thinking. You've just learned to do them. Uh, Isaac is our nine-year-old. And Isaac, for some reason, somewhere between our second child and our third child, I lost the capacity to teach someone how to tie their shoes. Because with the first two, with the first child, I mean, everybody knows you're a perfect parent. Like, the first child for us, she came along and Lilla, by one and a half, Lilla would put herself to bed at night. It was like a circus trip. Friends would come over and we'd be like, watch this. Lilla, it's bedtime. And she'd go, good night, good night, good night. And she'd walk herself to her room and I'd just lean back and be like, I'll sign autographs later. That's how good we are at this. Isaac came along who Isaac can do long-term division in his mind as a nine-year-old. And I'd go, all right, buddy, let's learn to tie your shoes. And he's like, I can't do this. I'll, I'll just do, I'll do Velcro the rest of my life. And I'm like, buddy, you can't do that. He's like, fine, I'll do flip-flops the rest of my life. And somewhere along the way, we, we, he just couldn't get it. And part of it, he goes, well, Dad, what do you think about when you're tying your shoes? And I go, anything but tying my shoes because somewhere along the way it's become so automated that's all a habit is is we've become so ingrained that it's natural to our environmental cues um we want to think through some of how these practices happen in our life so one question i would have you write down and think about later is what are your habits what are your habits what are the things you do Go through a day tomorrow and notice all the things you never notice. All the things you do without thinking. That just happen because they're a part of your rhythm. Uh, I read a book earlier this year uh, called, uh, (coughs) sorry, it's called Atomic Habits by James Clear. And he says, your habits shape your identity and your identity shapes your habits. My habits are much sharper in the morning because I'm a morning person. By the end of the day, I kind of dribble my way through my habits at the end of the day. Marissa can do deep calculus late at night, which to me sounds like slow water torture. And so your habits shape your identity, your identity shapes your habits. I think we've got to be clear about what are the habits that are forming us. So if we want to produce new habits and we are what we love, do we love Jesus? Now we're at church, and we're in the deep south, so you're like, well, yes, we do. But do we love Jesus, or do we not want to go to hell? Do we love Jesus? Are we certain we love Jesus? Are our affections directed towards Jesus? Are we really glad to have that in our back pocket just in case? Is is our relationship with Jesus this ongoing thing, or does he begin to function as a spiritual 911 that we're so glad is there? And Sunday mornings then become a part of our paying our taxes so that we've been there and we've been present so that when we need him, we can call on him and he'll be available. Or do we love him? Do we love him? Do we walk into a church or to an opportunity and we go, is this, am I liking this? Or do we walk into a place and a gathering and go, does this stir my affections towards Jesus? Now, it may sound like a simple question, but I would ask you to really consider, do we love Jesus? Because if we do, we'll pursue him. And and we'll want to look at our lives and form habits that promote, that grow, that strengthen that relationship like we would any other. Because love produces obedience. But the reverse is not always true. If we had time to do some like personal conversations and all have cups of coffee together... Do any of us have a backlash of not feeling love promoted at church because we were just told to do the right thing and you better do the right thing? And if you don't do the right thing, and that's the way we felt about what it was communicated to follow Jesus. I don't want to wake up every morning and go, I'm, I'm going to try to not mess my family up. I want to instead wake up every day and go, this is the greatest gift in my life for these four people. How am I going to do the best by them this day? Because love produces obedience, but the reverse is not always true. 
That's what I think these habits have to make us think about. Um, they're, they're, this is, I was doing a study over the last year and, and came across this, that the most important word in the Old Testament is hesed, which I think this makes the ninth time I've put it on the screen this year. It's like we're going to learn this one Hebrew word. Everybody say to your neighbor, hesed. If you only know one Hebrew word, you're ready for this one. It means covenant loyalty. It means keeping a promise no matter what. And the most important word in the New Testament is agape. Say to your neighbor, agape. If you hate everything else I say, you've learned one Hebrew and one Greek word. And so just drop those into a coffee conversation at work tomorrow, okay? So agape means sacrificial love. The kind of love that, that will do anything to maintain the relationship. It's the deepest form of love in the Greek language. I think we've got to learn some practical ways to put these things in practice because we want to grow our, we want to understand the hesed God has for us and he who has given us undivided sacrificial love, we want to learn how to respond with that kind of love because love produces obedience. Uh, my favorite quote of all time, uh, my, my axiom rather in my own life is that which we do not do on purpose we will accidentally never do. I think the majority of us, me and us, are kind of sleepwalking through our days. We fulfill our tasks. Everything, so many things are com computer automated. We don't have to engage the same way. We can mindlessly do them. And, and I think we're approaching our spiritual life the exact same way. Uh, Dallas Willard, it's a long quote but I think it's worth us reading. He says, the general human failing is to want what is right and important, but at the same time, not to commit to the kind of life that will produce the action we know to be right and the condition we want to enjoy. All right, so let's take his five lines and say, we know the best thing to do and we just choose not to live that way. He goes on to say, this is the feature of human character that explains why the road to hell is paved with good intentions. We intend what is right, but we avoid the life that would make it reality. I think if you're here on a Wednesday night, you're not only here because we have full children's programming or because the one thing you wanted to do on a Wednesday was bump into some of us. I think you're here on a Wednesday night from 6.30 to 8 o'clock because there is some deep longing in you to, to know and to grow and to have this map to go, am I walking in the right direction? And if that's true about us, how do we start structuring and framing our life in such a way that we get the result we actually want? Are you in relationships? Or are you in marriages? Or are you parenting in a way that you go, I don't love the results we're getting right now, but then we don't do anything about it? Do we feel stale and stagnant in our relationship with God? And we go, well, I'll just keep, I'll, I'll, I'll at least show up. Well, great. And now what do we do? How do we move our way forward? That's what we want to talk about. How do we build the life that leads us to the reality we actually want? And I think the first place that we're going to start is the center of that, that image I showed you earlier, and that's practices. What are our practices? The definition we're going to use is rhythmic habits that provide foundation for spiritual formation and rootedness in the love, the hesed, the agape of the Father. They're habits that build this foundation. I was having coffee with a guy earlier this morning. Uh, he, he's not from here in town, but he's got some connections to our church. And we were talking about, I was like, well, tell me what you're looking for in your relationship with Jesus. And he began to describe it. And here's the illustration, I, the image I would give you. Have, have you ever talked to somebody who they want to live in a house they can't afford yet? Does that make sense? Like, I wanted. I got. I got out of college, and I really wanted to buy like my dream house. But I, I at 23, the church I was working for then wasn't going to pay me in a way to lead me to able to buy my dream house because college still wanted me to make sure we were good. Is, are you with me? I think sometimes when we describe the life we want, all we think about are the walls and the roof and the chimney and the picket fence around the outside. Nobody gets excited telling you about the house they're going to build and go, let me tell you about that foundation. It is 2,600 feet of concrete and it looks beautiful in the ground. But without it, no house will stand. I think when we think about growing in the image of Jesus, we think about, well, I want it to look this way. I want to be able to talk this way. But 
practices root us in these things that lead us to these foundations of simply being rooted in the love of the Father for others. And as that foundation grows stronger, then we are able to let Christ build the life we actually want to live in. That's why these practices are so central. And that image we showed you at the beginning, it, it, um, it shows practices in the center and moving in every direction because they are foundational to every other way that we grow. So let's just talk through some of the practices. Uh, one of the practices that we want to talk about is reading Scripture. Reading Scripture. People tell me they don't read. Uh, I'll, have some, I'll say that to somebody and they'll go, I don't really like to read. And I'll go, okay. I'm not asking you to read Homer's Odyssey. I'm, I'm not asking you to read Shakespearean English and translate it for me. I, I, I'm asking us if we want to live in the reality of becoming more like Jesus. I'm asking for this one We'll even go down to some sections of this one book becoming foundational to your life. And so I I get that we may not love to read. I've told lots of people about ways you can get the Bible read to you in in an audio version. They can read it to you. And and I think when I say we need to read Scripture, I don't don't think the answer is to go, I'm just going to start in Genesis 1 and get rolling. Man, you will be so strong till the middle of Exodus. And then you'll be ready for Exodus to end and then... Lord help you, you'll turn to Leviticus. And you'll go, I don't think this is English anymore. Like, I don't even know what they're saying. And so I, I, I think we need a plan. Um, whenever I talk about reading scripture and having a plan, I, the, the illustration that always sticks in my mind is, if you are somebody who has ever gone to a gym, the quality of workout changes a lot when you just show up at the gym and go, I don't know what I want to do today. Compared to when you walk in and go, today I'm focused on this, I'm going to do these eight exercises. If you decide you're going to go for a run, the quality of your run will change. If you go, I'm just going to go for a, for a little jaunt, we'll see how we feel in a little while. Or if you go, I'm building towards a, I'm going to run a half marathon in six months, so now I have a plan. When I go to the gym with no plan, I'm going to wander around a couple of things, and in 30 minutes I'm going to go, you know, there's coffee on at my house. I could just go. Nobody's watching me. They don't know how long I've been here. Sprinkle a little extra water on it. look like I'm sweatier than I am. And we'll head to the house. But when I go out in with a plan, I can be very, I think we burn out in reading scripture because we don't have a plan. We'd love to help you with that. Uh, a couple of things we would suggest for you is uh, there's a resource called Foundations by Robbie and Candy Gallaty that is a guided way to read through scripture. They have a couple of versions. We'd recommend it to you. We have put together uh, some sprints where you can read through with a group of people um, sections of Scripture. There, we have some of them in the back. Our friend Chris Prather, who's our, our pastor in Start with the Orchard Startville, Chris put together a journal for his church that's got some Scripture reading and some ways to outline. We've got a few of those in the back. You're welcome to them. We, we don't want to just tell you to find a plan. We want to help you build a plan. I think Scripture has to become the dominant story in our life if we want to become more like Jesus. I'll tell you one practice I've been doing the last year. So think about everything I've told you so far tonight. That if hesed and agape are the two most important words in Scripture, I have this one section of Scripture that I've been reading every day since spring break of 2022. Uh, Spring break of 2022, I was supposed to go to Israel with my oldest child, and uh, we... When I went to, I never felt sick, but when I went, at the time, you had to be tested to leave the country for COVID. And uh, a really good friend of mine tested me for COVID, and he, he walked out of the room, and I'm sitting there with Lilla, and he walks back in, and it looked like he had just hit my dog. And he goes, you don't feel bad at all? And I was like, I don't. And he's like, well, you, you're not going to be able to go to Israel. You have COVID. And I was like, I don't. He goes, okay, well, I'm going to send you to another clinic. He sent me to another clinic. And you know what they told me? They told me I had COVID. And I made them give me a second test. You know what that test told me? I had COVID. And so I did not get to go to Israel. And I was so devastated. I was so upset because I'm looking at at the time at my 12-year-old child who's just had her heart broken because she can't go on her first international trip. And she can't go over there. My my parents were going. Like, she, she was so upset and my heart's broken. And so I I started reading this one passage every day that week because I just honestly didn't have a lot of words for how sad I was for her. I had been, but I really wanted to be there with her. 
And so since then, I've read this passage every single morning. And it's just these simple words. Ephesians 3, 16 through 21. It says, I pray that from his glorious unlimited resources, he would empower you with inner strength through his spirit. Then Christ will make his home in your hearts as you trust in him. Your roots will grow down into God's love and keep you strong. And may you have the power to understand, as all God's people should, how wide, long, high, and deep his love, his agape is. May you experience the agape love of Christ, though it is too great to understand fully. Then you will be made complete, which is the word, the telos, this idea that Wes held up for us, this fullness of life, maturity, and power that comes from God. So I've been reading that passage every single morning. It's the closest I've come in a long time to being able to quote you a long passage. Reading scripture doesn't mean you have to go from Genesis to Revelation every year. I do read other parts of the Bible, but this has become such a rhythmic part of my life. It's necessary. It's like breath for me in the morning. I grab a cup of coffee, and I read this passage when I walk back in from the gym. What does a plan look like for you in scripture? That's one practice. A second practice I would hold up for you that I think is foundational in our lives should be prayer. The the disciples were with Jesus day in and day out, right? They followed him for three years. It's like this ongoing apprenticeship. And yet they felt permission to look at Jesus and go, we don't know how to pray. Can you help us? Why is it that sometimes when we're in a room with other followers of Jesus and somebody goes, Does anybody want to pray for us? Everybody looks down to check and see if they remember to tie their shoes. We all just start going. My favorite thing is when I'm in a room and somebody will go, preacher, do you want to pray for us? And I was like, I'll pray, but not because I'm a preacher. I'm not vocationally praying, okay? This is joy prayer right now. I enjoy praying. You don't have to be an expert at it. Name me anything you know how to do. Are you a banker? Did you wake up one day and just go, I know everything about banking? No, you learned how to do it. Are you good with technology or computers? Do you, do you know how to hunt? Did you just come out of the womb going, give me my rifle. I'm ready to go right now. No, somebody showed you. Everything we do is a learned habit. Why, why do we not think that prayer is the same way? Prayer is a learned practice. I've said this a million times in our church. Uh, I've been here almost 20 years. And if you let me say another 20, I'll keep saying it. So if you don't like it, tell Brian to move me. Because I'm going to keep saying it. Do you want to know how you get, here's, here's the thing I say. Do you, do you want to get better at praying out loud? Great. Do you know how to do it? Pray out loud. That's how you get better at it. And if you go, I can't do that in front of people, no problem. Lock a door in a room that you're in and Pray. Just practice. Get used to the sound of your own voice. Well, I don't know all the things to say. Do you speak any other time? Then just start talking. You'll figure it out. And I'm not being sarcastic. I'm trying to encourage you. No one knows how they... uh, When I was a teenager, my dad was the pastor. And so people would look at me and go, Will, you're, you're the preacher, son. Would you pray? As if my dad every night was like, Boys, let's do our prayer drills. Look me in the eye. No, don't. Bow your head. Now let's work on how to pray. No. We just learn. So practice it. It's a learned practice. Uh, We don't have to be perfect at it to make some progress. We don't have to be perfect at it to make some progress. Pete Gregg has this great line. We talked about this as a church a year ago. He said, God wants to spend time with us even more than we want to spend time with him. This is a mind-blowing truth. It means that whenever you make the effort to approach the Lord in prayer, he's already waiting there for you with a smile. Do you believe that? No, no, not do you think you should believe that. If I could sit one-on-one with every single one of you tonight, the one question I wish we could wrestle with together is, do you believe God's posture towards you is affection? That he delights in you. It's what breaks my heart when people tell me, well, I don't like who I am. I don't, I'm, I'm not good at these important relational roles. I don't like who I am when I look in the mirror. And yet God looks at that and he, he's not disappointed with us. He's not crossing his arms at us. He is longing for us to let him set us free. Prayer is this place where we remember that God's posture is that he doesn't just hesed and agape. God likes us. Jesus wants to be with us, and I think if we believe that, it would change the way we pray. 
We're not praying to a far off deity. You know, I, I have a lot. I feel like all I say is I have coffee, and so which is partially true. Um, but I was visiting with a friend last week, and he said, "Well, tell me about how you, how is your prayer life at home different from your prayer life up front?" And I was like, "I don't know what you just said." And he's like, "Well, I don't mean like a preacher prayer." And I'm like, "I'm, I don't talk any different at home." I, when it's just me and God, I talk exactly like I do up front. And he's like, no, 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 like the Father and Son and Spirit stuff. And I'm like, yes. It's just it's the only way I know how to pray. Like we, we just learn what our prayer. So a couple of practical things so I don't get off on a tangent. And Wes doesn't knock me off the stage. Maybe a, a place to start is to set an alarm uh, for 7.30, 9, and 8 p.m. And just pray a one-minute prayer. Adjust according to your schedule. Just according to your schedule. Just make a regular rhythm. Uh, I was at the hospital uh, at a, a visiting a friend today, and at noon my alarm went off because that's the way my alarms are set. Just set an alarm for whatever times work for you. These are not magical hours where God is more attentive. These are just three made-up times in my rhythm. 7.30 is when I'm dropping kids off at school. Prayer is they get out of the vehicle. Noon, I'm usually... Uh, eating lunch somewhere or eating lunch with someone, which is a great time to talk about why my alarm is ringing. And 8 p.m. is about the time I beg our family to get in the same room for 10 minutes so I can go to bed soon. And it's a great time to gather together as family and say a short prayer at the end of the day. What are your rhythms? Set it up according to your own practices. And maybe one other thing to try is, is you're getting comfortable to the sound of your own voice. Find someone you trust and pray with them. Who you won't be, in, you're not worried about what they think. You know they love you either way. Just practice Praying out loud. So we've talked about scripture. We've talked about practice. I mean prayer as a practice. Uh, a third uh, rhythm habit I think is important for us to form is silence. Now I'm, I'm going to say less about this than any other. Not, not because I can't be quiet. But because Brian, is pre- Brian Collier, who's one of our pastors, our founding pastor of our church. Brian is preaching on this this Sunday. And I think that is something we ought to tune into. In the noisiest age in, our, in, in history, what is it like for you and I to find solitude and silence? I mean, have you ever said or had someone say to you, well, I just can't hear God's voice? I, I think sometimes God doesn't speak at the volume we would prefer, and maybe it's just not that he's not speaking, but we have the inability to hear him speak right now. I think silence and solitude are important for us. So uh, I'll let Brian preach more on that because there's plenty that I'm not going to get to tonight. But here, here's a practical thing you can try between now and Sunday. Pick a place in your home or at work where you can be uninterrupted for three minutes and set a timer and do nothing. And you're going to go, well, my brain's... Yeah, it is. It, it is. It's like a muscle. It's got to learn to allow silence. Just pick three minutes, set a timer, and every time you think about something, this is all you say, Lord, here I am. That's it. And you may go, but Will, what's going to happen? Yeah, I got no idea. I have no idea what's going to happen for you. But just find three minutes, three minutes. And when you get distracted, just say, Lord, here I am, as a way to recenter your attention. And as you get more comfortable, try to add a minute at a time. Just creating a little bit of space in our life to allow God to begin to speak. Again, Brian will talk more about that Sunday. Number four, the fourth one, let's talk about Sabbath. Uh, Sabbath, Sabbath is uh, this, it is the only spiritual discipline that's given to us in the Ten Commandments. And I would say it is the hardest one for me to convince people to practice in 2023. Now we'll argue and yell about where the Ten Commandments should still go, but then we'll pick this one and go, yeah, that one's not as important as the rest of them. But isn't it interesting that in the Ten Commandments, God didn't say, please get up and have a quiet time of 14 minutes every single day. He didn't say that. But he did say, set aside a day each week and declare it as holy. So a week from Sunday... Brian's going to teach on solitude this week. We're going to talk about Sabbath a week from Sunday. I'll walk, walk us through some of that. And, and so I tried to think about a couple of things that wouldn't make it into the sermon. 
Uh, one, I don't know that we'll make it in, but I think it's useful is the most common people question ask, the question people ask about Sabbath is, what do you do on Sabbath? And here's the twofold grid. It should be rest and it should be worshipful. I don't work in the garden or in a flower bed on Saturdays because that sounds terrible to me. If I break a law, if, I, if John Quaka arrests me and he really wants to punish me, he won't put me in a room with a bunch of other guys. I'll find a way to start talking to him. He'll take me outside to a flower bed filled with weeds and he'll say, do this for eight hours. I will repent of every crime I've ever committed right then. I'm not going to do that on Sabbath. But some of us may love to be outside. You love to have your hands in the dirt. Then that's the thing you should do. What is resting? What restores you? Uh, Recreation is a word we use, but if we really think about how words are formed, it's recreation. What is recreative in you? What, What renews you? If going to a sporting event renews you, you should do that. If you say words at a sporting event, you say no other time of the week. You might not should do that on your Sabbath. Wes and I discussed this earlier, so I'm going to take a chance. We're in a room full of adults, correct? Some of you are looking around going, eh, I know some of these people. I'm not sure. I can't say what I'm about to say on a Sunday morning. I can't say it on a Sunday morning because my sixth grader and my eighth grader and some of your kids are in the room, and we're adults. We know how to divide between what's appropriate and what's not. I don't struggle with language. I don't struggle with what I say. I have plenty of faults. That's just not one of them anymore. But Eugene Peterson, who is one of the most gifted, he passed away just a few years ago, was one of the most influential pastors of the last hundred years. If you've ever heard of the message paraphrase of the Bible, Eugene Peterson did that all himself from beginning to end. And Peterson was asked one time about how is a Sabbath different from a day off? You with me? You ever taken a day off? You've never taken a comp day? You've built up hours and you've got work leave? You've, You've done that, right? A day off? And again, I'm using a very harsh word to make a point, okay? Eugene Peterson said that a day off as your Sabbath is a bastard Sabbath. It is the illegitimate child of religious obligation and American, not American, Western productivity mindset of I've worked myself to the tilt where I'm about to collapse, so I have to ask them for a day off so I can get greased back up and get right back in there. A Sabbath is not the same thing as just a day off. A Sabbath is created to attune our hearts more to God. It is the single most difficult practice for us to exercise in 2023. Everything, I don't have it when I teach, but our devices are wired to make us more productive than we've ever been. One of the things that Wes, if you haven't heard Wes's sermon from Sunday on digital distraction and and fasting from it, please forget what I've said and go listen to that. One of the lines that Wes talked about from the book that we're kind of elevating in the series, Ruthless Elimination of Hurry, is John Mark Comer says, if your rule of life doesn't include some kind of technological disconnect, then we're doing it wrong. When do you not ever have your device? When do you have it where only certain, do, do you use the focus mode on your phone? Do you know how to use that? We'd love to show you where only certain people can get you at certain times. We've got to be aware of how much we need real recreation. Sabbath is good for that. Um, I won't say anything else because then you won't show up a week from Sunday when we talk about it. I'll read one quote I'm not going to use that day. Wayne um, Mueller writes this great book creatively called Sabbath, and he says, if busyness can become a kind of virus, we do not have to stretch our perception very far to see that the Sabbath time effortless, nourishing rest can invite a healing of this virus. Man, think about that language in light of hurry. When we consecrate a time to listen to the still, small voices, we remember the root of inner wisdom that makes work fruitful. We remember from where we are um, most deeply nourished and see more clearly the shape and texture of the people and things before us. We're going to talk a lot more about it a week from Sunday. But if there's one thing I can encourage you to write in your rule of life, if you can't do 24 hours, if it's 6 hours, if it's 12 hours, finding some time each week, rhythmically as you possibly can, for you to be 
recreated. Get outside. We'll talk more about it then. I'm get down. Uh, uh, let's see. Let's do, we'll do one. We'll do two last practices and then we'll wrap up. Uh, worship should be a spiritual practice for us. Now it can be a corporate gathering. It can be an individual gathering. It can be something you do on your own. Uh, ultimately, reason, the reason we gather in for worship at eight thirty, ten, and eleven thirty is not for us. It's not for me. It's not about you. It's not about the kind of songs you like or don't like. It doesn't, it's not about that worship. It's not an entity. It's not an event. It is, when it becomes that way, God actually says in Isaiah 1 that he hates it because worship is really about us simply being in God's presence. It's about us simply being in God's presence. It's about us being formed and shaped. It's about us having this opportunity to be together. We all worship. We talked about that earlier, but it's about what we worship. I wonder what it would be like, what, what approach we would walk in if we came into a gathering this Sunday and we approach it as an opportunity to, to remember how loved we are and to communicate to God how much we love Him in return. I'm not talking about over-emotionalism. I'm talking about this deep abiding awareness that the idea that Jesus transactionally died on my behalf is not some metaphor or allegory. But then on a southwestern side of Jerusalem, there was a rock quarry where a cross was placed and Jesus paid everything he could on our behalf. Then that love extended from him is now available to the likes of folks like you and me. With our mistakes and our brokenness, and our missteps, all the things that even as we talk tonight, the enemy would pull shame up over us like a blanket and allow us to be suffocated by it. Worship is this place where we, re I can't be quiet in worship. I can't be still in worship because that's just how I operate. I don't think that's for everyone. But what if we just entered into it as this place to remember how deeply loved we are and to love God in return? I sing passionately when we sing, and nobody has ever asked me to do that on a microphone because I don't do it well. But I still offer what I have as a joyful noise, at least to me, because I find him worthy of it. What if we approach worship as a chance to remember how loved we are rather than a critique of what we like and what we don't like? Marissa has been so helpful. For, uh, my wife has been so helpful in my own life. And as I listen to her disciple other people to say that, Sometimes the most impactful worships, uh, times of worship in a corporate gathering for her has been when she least wanted to go. And one time I, I remember hearing her say to a young leader in our life, she said, um, it's almost like all God requires at times is my availability. To just be available. Worship is an important practice. And the last one is fasting. Wes talked about this a little bit Sunday. Fasting means giving up something we enjoy. It means giving up something in our life that is shaping and forming us. It's not simply us skipping a meal. It's not simply us dieting in a new way. Uh, it is about us making specific decisions about what is what our appetites are longing for. If you've ever done any kind of fast from food, you start to notice all the things that play into what we're feeding into our bodies, the ways that we feel, the ways that we react to things. And so fasting in Scripture is mostly often only connected with food, but that's not the only mechanism. Fasting is about creating space for the Spirit to move in your life. Fasting is about creating space for the Spirit to move in your life. We are not the sum of our appetites. We are a vessel in which the Spirit can fill up. Fasting is not about getting God's attention. It's about creating space for God to get our attention back. Now I want to give us time to worship together. Uh, still, I want to give us time. We're going to talk in some groups in a little bit. Uh, but I would connect. If you got one of those rules of life from us, I hope you start to look at where these practices fit in your life. Is fasting something that you do monthly? Uh, under the practices column, that's what we're raising up here. For me, worship is weekly. Scripture reading and prayer are daily. Uh, Sabbath is weekly. Fasting is a monthly practice. W what does that rhythm look like for you? 
And if you want to talk more detail about any of those, grab somebody you know, find one of our staff members, email me, will at theorchard.net, what, whatever is most helpful to you. Here's why we think this conversation is so important. Because the image Jesus has is we are to become perfect, to become holy. The telos is that we're becoming more like our Father who is in heaven. Something is forming and shaping us. We'll give Dallas Willard one last opportunity. He says, we become like Christ by doing one thing, following him in the overall style of life he chose for himself. The thing about every practice that we've talked about tonight is Jesus implemented every single one of them. This is how Jesus chose to live. And if my aim is to become more like Jesus, I want to figure out how to take ancient practice and apply them to my modern life. That when they lay my bones in the ground, I might be a little bit more like Jesus than I am this evening. I'm going to pray for us. Rick and Dina are going to come lead us in worship. And we're going to sing another song together. And we'll give you some instruction to spend a few minutes talking with some folks that are around you. So let me pray for us. God, I thank you for your word. I thank you for the opportunity for us to gather on a Wednesday night and to talk about things that matter. And Lord, I pray. I pray by the things we've discussed and the things that we've considered that we might hear from you about what the next steps are for our life. What are the ways that you are leading us? Lord, I pray tonight, I just am overwhelmed to pray Lord, will you make us aware of what is shaping us that we're unaware of? The influence of the, the music we take in or the shows that we watch or the, the news channel that we're clinging to, whatever it is, Lord, will you make us aware of the things that are shaping us that we might need to let go of, that we might receive more of who you are? So, Lord, stir up a hunger, a longing for you, that we want to be with you. Lord, if we've been walking with you for 60 years, would you tonight give us this new understanding of how loved we are, that your natural disposition towards wretches like us is to say that we are loved, that we matter, that we're your beloved, that we're your children. We're not the sum of our productivity or our worst mistakes. We are the sum of the price that was paid to set us free. So, Lord, may we this night make room for you to move and operate and do surgery on our soul. That we might become just a little bit more the people you've called, created, and crafted us to become. That's my prayer for these, my friends. To you, our Father, in the name of Jesus, and by the power of your Holy Spirit, we pray. Amen.